पेज 153 पैटर्न्स ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी बाय एस चंद्रशेखर लुक फॉर दीज एक्सप्रेशन एंड गेस द मीनिंग फ्रॉम द कॉन्टेक्स्ट कोल्ड फिलोसफी पिकारस्क टेल लुक्ड एस्केंस एपोसाइट इंटरल्यूनेशंस ऑफ लाइफ म्यूचुअली सस्टेनिंग एंडेवर्स सेनोटैप एट्रॉफी प्रोफेटिक डिसर्नमेंट हीरोफेंट्स ऑफ एन अनएप्रीहेंडेड इंस्पिरेशन बट आई मस्ट रिटर्न टू द क्वेश्चन वाई इज देयर अ डिफरेंस इन द पैटर्न्स ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी अमंग द प्रैक्टिशनर्स इन द आर्ट्स एंड द प्रैक्टिशनर्स इन द साइंसेज आई शेल नॉट अटैम्प टू आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन डायरेक्टली but i shall make an assortment of remarks which may bear on the answer first i should like to consider how scientists and poets view one another when one thinks of the attitude of poets to science one almost always thinks of wordsworth and keats and their off quoted lines a fingering slave one that would peep and botanize upon his mother's grave a reasoning self suffering thing an intellectual all in all sweet is the lore which nature brings our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect wordsworth page 154 do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy there was an awful rainbow once in heaven we know her woof her texture she is given in the dull catalog of common things philosophy will clip an angel's wings keats these lines perhaps find an echo in a statement of lois dickinson when science arrives it expels literature it is to be expected that one should find scientists countering these views thus peter medawar counters lois dickinson by The case I shall find evidence for is that when literature arrives it expels science the way things are at present it is simply no good pretending that science and literature represent complementary and mutually sustaining endeavors to reach a common goal on the contrary where they might be expected to cooperate they compete it would not seem to me that one can go very far in these matters by pointing accusing fingers at one another so let me only say that the attitudes of wordsworth and keats are by no means typical a scientist should rather consider the attitude of shelley shelley is a scientist's poet it is not an accident that the most discriminating literary criticism of shelley's thought and work is by a distinguished scientist desmond king helley as king helley has pointed out shelley's attitude to science emphasizes the surprising modern climate of thoughts in which he chose to live and shelley describes the mechanism of nature with a precision and a wealth of detail unparalleled in english poetry and here is ian whitehead's testimony shelley's attitude to science was at the opposite pole to that of wordsworth he loved it and is never tired of expressing in poetry the thoughts which it suggests it symbolizes to him joy and peace and illumination i should like to read two examples from shelley's poetry which support what has been said about him the first example is from his cloud which fuses together a creative myth a scientific monograph and a gay picaresque tale of cloud adventure page 155 I am the daughter of earth and water and the nursling of the sky I pass through the pores of the ocean and the shores I change but I cannot die for after the rain which never stain the pavilion of heaven is bare and the winds and sunbeams with their convex gleams build up the blue dome of air I silently laugh at my own cenotaph and out of the caverns of rain like a child from the womb like a ghost from the tomb i arise and unveil it again the second example is from prometheus unbound which has been described by herbert reed as 
द ग्रेटेस्ट एक्सप्रेशन एवर गिवन टू ह्यूमैनिटीज डिजायर फॉर इंटेलेक्चुअल लाइट एंड स्पिरिचुअल लिबर्टी द लाइटनिंग इज हिज स्लेव हेवन्स अटमोस्ट दीप गिव्स अप हर स्टार्स एंड लाइक अ फ्लॉक ऑफ शीप दे पास बिफोर हिज आई आर नंबर्ड एंड रोल ऑन द टेम्पेस्ट इज हिज स्टीड ही स्ट्राइट्स द एयर and the abyss shout from her depth laid bare heaven hast those secrets man unveils me i have none let me turn to a slightly different aspect of the matter what are we to make of the falling confession of charles darwin up to the age of 30 or beyond it poetry of many kinds such as the works of milton gray byron wordsworth coleridge and shelley gave me great pleasure and even as a schoolboy i took intense delight in shakespeare especially historical plays i have also said that formerly pictures gave me considerable and music very great delight but now for many years i cannot endure to read a line of poetry i have tried lately to read shakespeare and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me I have almost lost my taste for pictures or music. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collection of facts. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone in which the higher tastes depend, I cannot conceive. Or consider this: Faraday discovered the laws of electromagnetic induction, and his discoveries led him to formulate concepts such as lines of force and fields of force which were foreign to the then prevailing modes of thought page 156 they were in fact looked askance by many of his contemporaries but of faraday's ideas maxwell wrote with prophetic discernment the way in which faraday made use of his idea of the lines of force in coordinating the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction shows him to have been in reality a mathematician of a very high order one from whom the mathematicians of the future may derive valuable and fertile methods we are probably ignorant even of the name of the science which will be developed out of the materials we are now collecting when the great philosopher next after faraday makes his appearance and yet when gladstone then the chancellor of the exchequer interrupted faraday in his description of his work on electricity by the impatient inquiry but after all what use is it faraday's response was why sir there is every probability that you will soon be able to tax it and faraday's response has always been quoted most approvingly it seems to me that to darwin's confession and to faraday's response what shelley has said about the cultivation of the sciences in his defense of poetry is apposite the cultivation of those sciences which have enlarged the limits of the empire of men over the external world has for want of the poetical faculty proportionally circumscribed those of the internal world and men having enslaved the elements remains himself a slave lest you think that shelley is not sensitive to the role of technology in modern society let me quote what he has said in that connection undoubtedly the promoters of utility in this limited sense have their appointed office in society they follow the footstep of poets and copy the sketches of their creations into the book of common life they make space and give time shelley's a defense of poetry from which i have just quoted is one of the most moving documents in all of english literature w b yeats called it the profoundest essay on the foundation of poetry in the english language page 157 the essay should be read in its entirety but allow me to read a selection poetry is the record of the best and happiest moments of the happiest and the best minds poetry thus makes immortal all that is best and most beautiful in the world it arrests the vanishing apparitions which haunt the interlunations of life 
poetry is indeed something divine it is at once the center and circumference of knowledge it is that which comprehends all science and that too which all science must be referred it is at the same time the root and blossom of all other systems of thought poets are the hierophants of an unapprehended inspiration the mirrors or the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present the words which express what they understand not the trumpets which sing to battle and feel not what they inspire the influence which is moved not but moves poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world on reading shelley's a defense of poetry the question insistently occurs why there is no similar a defense of science written by a scientist of equal endowment perhaps in raising the question i have in part suggested an answer to the one i have repeatedly asked during the lecture about the author s chandrashekhar who lived between 1910 to 1995 was a distinguished astrophysicist and nobel laureate he was a professor emeritus in the department of astronomy and astrophysics at the university of chicago he received many awards and wrote several books truth and beauty from which patterns of creativity has been taken is a collection of seven lectures addressing aesthetics and motivation in the pursuit of science and contemplates pattern of scientific creativity page 158 The extract is from the Noran Edward Byerson lecture titled Shakespeare Newton and Beethoven or Patterns of Creativity Understanding the text 1 How does Shelley's attitude to science differ from that of Wordsworth and Keats 2 It is not an accident that the most discriminating literary criticism of Shelley's thought and work is by a distinguished scientist Desmond King Hele how does this statement bring out the meeting point of poetry and science 3 what do you infer from darwin's comment on his indifference to literature as he advanced in years 4 how do the patterns of creativity displayed by scientists differ from those displayed by poets 5 What is the central argument of the speaker talking about the text discuss in small groups 1 poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world 2 poetry and science are incompatible 3 on reading shelley's a defense of poetry the question insistently occurs why there is no similar a defense of science written by a scientist of equal endowment appreciation 1 how does the assortment of remarks compiled by the author give us an understanding of the ways of science and poetry 2 considering that this is an excerpt from a lecture how does the commentary provided by the speaker string the arguments together 3 the cloud fuses together a creative myth a scientific monograph and a gay picaresque tale of cloud adventure explain page 159 language work 1 how do the words in bold in the lines below illustrate the poet's ability to convey criticism cryptically our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect in this meddling intellect misshapes murder to dissect are given in bold to explain the contradiction in the similes like a child from the womb like a ghost from the tomb 3 explain the metaphor in the line poets are the mirrors of gigantic shadows that futurity cast on the present suggested reading literature and science by matthew arnold 
Read and enjoy the excerpts from an interview given by S. Chandrasekhar to Deccan Herald, 23rd January, 1994, Issue. Question. You came to America in 1936. Do you think you would have achieved what you did had you stayed back in India? Chandrasekhar. In a narrow sense, the answer is no. There were better facilities for work here. I was also disconcerted with science politics in India. I was very sensitive and I desired the mental peace to do science the way I wanted. Secondly, how can one evaluate scientific achievement? It is not a personal accomplishment. I had many students and collaborators. Science has to be an integrated effort. Otherwise, it would be too narrow. Who was your earliest mentor and who influenced you most in your career? I had no mentor and nobody influenced me. I wrote my thesis on my own. I have always been alone. This is not criticism. It is the character of my work. Do you recall your mother and her attitudes which may have shaped yours? Yes. I recall a particular incident which revealed my mother's extraordinary awareness. I was hardly 10 years old when she woke me up one morning and said, Do you know, Ramanujam is dead. It has come in the newspaper. The very fact that she realized that Ramanujam's death was an important event showed her enlightenment in these matters. Her attitudes did influence me a great deal. Continued. Page 160. Has your wife been a great support to you in your scientific career? I have mentioned Lalita in my book, Truth and Beauty. My biographer Kameshwar Vali has also written a whole chapter on my wife. Suddenly with a smile. Do you know? The American press called that the best chapter. Have you at any point of time regretted your decision to leave the country of your birth? There is no point in regretting or being happy over decisions you have made. I think it's irrational to regret the past anyway. You must reconcile yourself to the life you have chosen and lived. Do you enjoy teaching? I always integrated teaching with research. They support each other. What is it that makes Indians achieve more in this country, America, than in India? Do you think it could be the academic climate? I wouldn't judge achievement by awards. The quality of science in India is good too. But I remember in the 1930s, the great scientists of that country were in the universities. But today, it is not so. And that is a loss. Has your personal life been complete and happy? That you should ask Lalita. Maybe I could have given more. Pause. I don't believe that a scientist, a true scientist, can ever have a complete personal life. Pause again. I sometimes wonder whether all that I did and accomplished in my lifetime, was it really worth it? Kameshwar Vali later interpreted this comment as, when Chandra asked, was it worth it, he is not being negative. It is just an awareness, another dimension of realization which dawns as one gets older.